thank you all for being here. Um, I'm excited to give probably uh, the lowest energy seminar that you'll see this semester, hopefully not in the way that I speak, but in the spectral range that we're looking at. Um, and so I'm gonna try to convince you that MEDGE Zanes is a really useful tool for inorganic spectroscopy and photophysics. And so I've got sort of my boring title here, but the more exciting title is what did the metals know and when did they know it? I started giving this talk when the impeachment hearings were going on. And so I thought this was an appropriate uh, title for this. And so just first I wanna thank my fantastic group because as you know, they're the ones who do all the work here. Um, and um, so I just wanna mainly um, thank everybody from Ming Fu Lin, who is the first postdoc I had, who's now a staff scientist at LCLS to a bunch of graduate students and undergrads. And so I just wanna highlight them here. All right, um, the work that we do is trying to measure and control energy transfer in systems with heavy atoms or multiple heavy atoms. And when I say heavy atoms, I mean things like uh, transition metals, things like lead and iodine and bromine. So we look at some small molecule transition metal photophysics. We look at spin crossover in larger systems where there are coupled electron transfer and spin crossover events. We're moving into some solar fuels catalysts and I'll give an example, some future work of this. Um, and then we also have a separate project on organic halide perovskite photovoltaics that I will not be talking about. So, um, the basic idea is if we're trying to measure fast events in transition metal complexes, and by this I mean things like uh, very fast spin crossover events, things like finding transition states and reactive intermediates in catalytic reactions, we really need to know the electronic structure of each metal. We want to be element specific at the oxidation state, spin state, and ligand field. This is all stuff that this audience um, I think is near and dear to your heart from the other x-ray spectroscopy that we do. Um, the big thing that we really want to focus on is getting fast time resolution because if some reaction is gated by a molecular motion, metal ligand bond vibrations are on the order of 100 femtoseconds. And so we need a probe that is going to be faster than that if we're going to resolve which vibrations are causing the exciting phenomenon in our molecules. So really the big picture question is, where's every electron at every point in time in these systems? So I'm gonna sort of ground us in um, the energy scales that we're looking at here. So we all learn sort of in undergrad chemistry about NMR and infrared spectroscopy. We've got UV vis where we're essentially probing from HOMO to LUMO. And then um, the subject of the seminar series, which is the X-ray absorption, which is now down a much higher energy here. And here we're probing from these atomic core levels up to the unoccupied orbitals. And we're very familiar with K-edge spectroscopy from the 1S to the valence and L-edge spectroscopy from generally the 2P to the valence, um, certainly for transition metals. And if we wanna do femtosecond spectroscopy at these energy ranges, and my PowerPoint is frozen, um, so I'm gonna to have to kill it and reopen it. Hold on a second. Um, that's impeccable timing, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. It's fine, not a problem. All right, let's try this again. All right, let's get to, okay, are we back? Excellent, I see thumbs up. Okay, so uh, if you wanna do femtosecond spectroscopy at these energy ranges, there are these fantastic linear accelerators called free electron lasers that will get you um, femtosecond time resolution, even now to attosecond time resolution. This is the closest one to me at the Lionel Coherent Light Source. Obviously, uh, several of these have opened up in the world over the past few years. Um, and these are fantastic machines and I've done experiments there, so I love them. Um, but I'm also lazy and don't like to travel and I'd rather stay in my own lab. And so we have built this tabletop system 
which is a femtosecond extreme ultraviolet source. And this just fits on this basically a 22 foot long laser table um, and a bunch of ultra high vacuum chambers. And so this is in the energy range of the extreme ultraviolet, which is the tens to hundreds of electron volts. And in our hands, we're using this as a probe of 3p to valence transitions. And we're trying to see what is the information content in the spectral region and how can we complement the higher energy X-ray probes. So I'm going to probably just call these very soft X-rays or X-rays through this talk because whatever intuition you have for sort of the experimental constraints of L-edge spectroscopy transfer pretty well into this energy range. Um, if you have an intuition for ultraviolet spectroscopy, that's not going to help you. So I'm going to keep calling these X-rays. The way that we make these, I'm not going to talk a lot about the physics, but what we do is we take a pulsed near infrared laser, we focus it into neon gas, and we magically get an XUV pulse out the other side. If we zoom in a little closer at one of these gas atoms, uh, say neon or argon, we've got at this point a very strong oscillating electric field from the laser pulse. And it's such a strong field that if we look at the Coulomb potential for one of those neon atoms, we can perturb it so much that we rip an electron away from the neon, we accelerate it in this oscillating electric field, and we slam it back into the nucleus. And the energy that it picks up, that the electron picks up surfing this electric field wave is released as an X-ray photon. Um, and so if, so I'm actually not gonna be talking about attosecond science in this talk. However, if you do see any talks on attosecond science, it's using the same technique to make very short pulses. This is um, a drawing of the instrument. Uh, my background is actually the photo of it that I showed before. Um, so we make the XUV, uh, so we focus our infrared light into this long uh, tube called a semi-infinite gas cell. We make the XUV photons right at the end. They come out through the vacuum. We filter out the residual infrared light. We focus it onto the sample. And we're doing this in transmission mode um, on very thin samples on silicon nitride membranes. Then we come onto a diffraction grating and an array CCD. Um, I noticed a couple of people from Robert Baker's group here. Um, so if you wanna see doing similar stuff that what we do, but in reflection mode off thicker surfaces, uh, check out Robert Baker's group. Um, we're doing pump probe spectroscopy. So we have a bunch of optics that can change the color of our pump beam into basically any color of the rainbow. We can then cross that on our sample and uh, so we can excite our sample before we probe it. And of course, we can also do UV vis transient absorption. So in our hands, we get these broad continua. Um, this is the one we get using argon, which is easier to ionize, so we get lower energy photons. Or neon is harder to ionize, so we get higher energy photons. Here we're cutting off the spectrum with a filter, but we could go out to about 100 electron volts in our current system. Um, you'll notice these spikes. These are at the odd harmonics of our driving laser field. And if this was a physics, like if I were a hardcore physicist, I'd really want to talk about the peak structure here, but I'm a chemist. And so I'm just going to treat this as a white light continuum in this XUV spectral region. And we get a time resolution of about 30 femtoseconds, um, fairly broad energy range. And we're detecting about 10 to the 5 photons per second in every 0.1 eV energy bin on our detector. So this is at the detector after passing through the sample. So many, many orders of magnitude lower flux um, than at a synchrotron or free electron laser, but we're not counting single photons. So um, it's a nice energy range. We also don't have to worry about much damage from the X-ray beam itself. Right, so I mentioned that we want to know what is the information content in the spectral region, because until these tabletop sources came online, there was um, there was not a whole lot of spectroscopy done in this XUV spectral region. There was um, one free electron laser in Europe that could do this and a couple small synchrotrons here, but um, it's not a field that really took off. And so I'm gonna try to prove to you that the information content is quite rich. So these are the ground state spectra of iron oxide, cobalt oxide, and nickel oxide. You see that because we're doing a 3P to 3D transition, we get some elemental specificity. So there's some overlap between iron and cobalt, but still cobalt is holding on to its 3P electrons more tightly than iron. And so we get a blue shift 
of five to 10 electron volts from metal to metal. There's also a lot of structure in these peaks. And so I'm gonna walk you through the iron oxide spectrum to show what these spectra mean. So here, if we do some background subtraction, you'll see that we have a little peak and a big peak. Okay, where does this come from? Well, this is a D5 system. It's in an octahedral ligand field and it's high spin. And so we're starting in our 3P6, 3D5 ground state. We turn on electron-electron repulsion in our Hamiltonian and we get our multi-electron term symbols that we order using Hund's rules and find out that we have a sextet S ground state. After the XGB photon comes in, we're in our core hole state. So we have a 3P5, 3D6 system. Once again, we get our multi-electron term symbols and we would find that we can only excite from the sextet S up to the sextet P because we need delta L of one in our transition. Now we turn on our ligand field. We bring in essentially point charges at the locations of our octahedral ligands. We impose our ligand field symmetry and we find from our group theory textbook that we get a sextet A1 ground state. Our excited states, um, there's this sextet P becomes a sextet T1. This is an allowed state because our transition dipole operator transforms as T1. So we get one strong peak from the formerly allowed transition, but now this forbidden transition to the sextet F branches into three states, one of which is allowed. So we should get a weak transition into that state that used to be forbidden and a strong transition into the state that used to be allowed. Okay, so we get a little peak and a big peak. That's exactly what we saw in the experimental spectrum. Now, we do have a little bit of spin orbit coupling in this 3P core. It's less than, an, um, it's less than one electron volt. We don't split the spectrum into the L3 and the L2 edge, like with L edge absorption, but it's enough to scramble this a little bit and turn these two nice peaks into a forest of sticks in our simulation. But the important thing is that we can simulate our spectrum nearly quantitatively um, using semi-empirical ligand field multiplet theory. Um, so here you see the little peak and the big peak. Um, we work with Frank de Groot when I, back when I was a postdoc to really figure out how to do this for M edges, we basically use a customized version of CTM for XAS. Um, and those of you who are aficionados of that program, we have to do things like calculate the line width of each one of these peaks because you see that this, the higher energy peak is broader than lower energy peak. We've got a Fano line shape, which I can discuss in the questions later, but we understand these spectra really well. Uh, the only input for the simulation is the fact that it's a D5 system and our ligand field strength 10 dq. Um, and I'll show you some more simulations later. All right, so a big part of the first part of our group's work was to do this for molecular complex as well. There's lots more background absorption, um, lots of experimental problems, but it works. And so for example, we can show some oxidation state specificity. Here's a cobalt two octahedral complex with a spectrum in blue, cobalt three complex with a spectrum in green. The cobalt three is holding onto its electrons much more tightly than cobalt two. And so we get a blue shift of the spectrum. If we look at ligand field specificity, this is a cobalt two of the same octahedral complex again. And then here's a square planar cobalt two system. And we see that the absorption edge is at about the same place because they're both cobalt two, but now the shape is totally different because we have different selection rules from being in the D4H point group and the octahedral point group. You'll also see there's a spin state change uh, that also affects the spectrum. Um, this next slide is my favorite one from the whole talk. So any of you who are just gonna remember one thing, just remember this one slide. This is an iron polypyridyl complex I think of this as a fancy iron trispipi, where at room temperature, these iron nitrogen bonds are long. And so it's a weak ligand field and it's high spin. And we get this, um, this spectrum with two peaks um, or a shoulder and a peak where the solid line is the experiment. The dashed line is our simulation. The only thing we do for the simulation is we look in an inorganic chemistry paper, we pull out a value of 10 dq and we put it into our simulation. So we're not doing any shenanigans trying to get this to match better than it just naturally does. If we take the same molecule, the same physical sample, and we cool it to liquid nitrogen temperature, 
This is a thermal spin crossover complex. These iron nitrogen bonds shrink and we get a strong field low spin complex and the absorption spectrum completely changes. We now have this three peak structure and there's a blue shift. All right, so this is a, a, what I'll call the first order electronic structure. Is this the high spin or low spin D6 system? We can now start to think, okay, what about second order electronic structure? What is the exact value of 10 dQ? And can we extract that from the spectrum? Um, and so we synthesize this very strong field complex of this N heterocyclic carbene with a very strong ligand field. And what you'll see is that we go from this three peak spectrum, we maintain the three peaks, but we suppress these higher two and we blue shift it. Okay, so this is still sort of qualitatively um, looks like this other low spin system, but we've perturbed it in a predictable way. All right, and so we can understand these differences, basically once again, going back to ligand field theory. Um, for those of you who, um, who do a lot of LS absorption, this may be obvious, but this is a very different way of getting spectra than the cage people are used to. So I'm gonna keep going into this a little more. Um, so the inorganic chemists in the audience have seen these Tanabe Sugana diagrams. These are used for, for understanding D to D absorption spectrum, where we have the energy of the state versus the ligand field splitting 10 dQ. Um, in a low spin complex, we're mostly looking at the atomic like states. In the high spin complex, we're looking at the ligand field symmetry states. And there's a particular crossing where the ground state goes from a high spin ground state to a low spin ground state. So we can make the same thing for our XUV absorption, where down here at the bottom is our traditional Tanabe Sugana diagram. And up here are the, um, the core hole states with a 3P5, 3D7 in this case. And you can see that in, um, the, in the low spin case, our ground state is a quintet and there are only two quintet accessible excited states. So we get two peaks in our spectrum. After we cross over to, um, uh, sorry, that was the high spin. When we cross over to low spin, um, now we're in a singlet ground state. There are three singlet excited states. And so we get three peaks in the spectrum. And you can see that these things are blue shifting over time. We're actually working on a paper where we make uh, quantitative Tanabe Sugano like diagrams where we can see how the intensity of the peaks also changes as you change 10 dQ. And so, really, we're just looking at you know, how much information can we pull out from these M edge same spectra. Um, so, this is going to be my first break point. Um, the, the conclusions for ground state spectroscopy is now we can do Zane spectroscopy for molecular complexes on this tabletop instrument. We can identify sort of all the basic stuff that people like to look at with hard X-ray absorption. Um, and we get a really nice match to experiment without any um, shenanigans in our calculations. And of course, there are lots of technical milestones to get us to this point. But I wanna stop here for any questions and so I can drink some tea. Well, I can't promise that you'll have very long to drink tea. That's all um, right. All right. Uh, first, we have a, uh, Yulia Pushkar, you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, first thing, can you please explain us about the sample environment? Because sample must be extremely thin and uh, maybe you went uh, a bit fast uh, about your detector. Okay. Yeah, basically, sample environment thin, how you can freeze in it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So our sample environment is in general, we have um, silicon nitride membranes about 50 to 100 nanometers thick, and we will either spin coat or vapor deposit a layer of molecules on top of that um, in the order of 50 nanometers thick, uh, five zero. Um, so that's sort of our basics. Uh, but lately we've been doing things like embedding molecules in a polymer matrix and having freestanding uh, polystyrene films with our molecules embedded within it. Um, later in this talk, I'm going to briefly mention that we're moving into some liquid sheet experiments where we're trying to do solution phase spectroscopy at the M edge. Um, our detector is just, um, it's an XUV CCD. Um, basically, it's a back thinned um, CCD with no, um, no anti reflective coating on the front that we get from Andor and um, so we just have diffraction grading, then we disperse our continuum onto the array CCD. Great, thank you.
Eng Ha, your question. Uh, yeah, uh, a very interesting topic, by the way. So I'm just curious, if you shift your energy a little bit, you probably will hit the so-called M1 edge. And how does that look? Is that something similar to the traditional K edge? All right, so let's go back maybe Oh, come on, am I frozen again? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing again um, while I explain that. So the um, we have never seen the M1 edge. You probably noticed that there's a pretty broad, um, you've got this Fano line shape that basically once we get past the edge, we, could, we quickly get to the 3P photo ionization. And so, uh, when you get to that point, it's a pretty broad spectrum there, and the M1 edge is predicted to be fairly weak, so we haven't observed that. Um, it could be there, but we don't know about it. Um, we also... Uh, all right, let's just get this going again. All right, so we've never seen the M1 edge. We think it's buried under our broad final line shape and our the fact that there's a 3P photo ionization. And you'll notice that most of our simulations don't match the experiment once you get maybe five to 10 EV above the absorption edge because we're not considering those kinds of things. We also don't see the XAFs wiggles. Um, and our understanding for that is because um, if you're doing XAFs from say the K edge, you have a nice point source for your photoelectron from the 1S orbital, but now we have these big 3P orbitals. And um, so we have uh, we don't really have a point source for the photoelectron. We also have the angular momentum of the photoelectron, and that just scrambles everything out there. Plus, our wavelength of light is around 15 to 20 nanometers, and so you wouldn't get uh, much interference from that anyway. Okay. Um, uh, last question from Evan Jarman. Hi, Josh. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question. Uh, on the low temperature spin state transitions. Yes. Uh, basically, that just jumped out as really interesting, but it's not really a physical phenomenon I've seen before or see very often. Is that something you see with a lot of compounds or ligands? Is it common in nature? This is a fairly common phenomenon. Um, the reason for this, and I'll give, let me wait about, uh, uh, let me wait a couple slides and I'll be able to explain with the figure because most of the rest of this talk is going to be um, doing about photo-induced spin crossover um, or spin state transitions, and um, and so I'll be able to explain it a bit better then. All right. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, um, Josh. Um, we'll hold we'll hold a couple more questions for later, but okay. you should try to project your screen again or share your screen again. Oh, I thought I was there. We go. In my mind, I was already projecting it. Am I sharing? I don't think I'm sharing the right Yes, thing. yes, you're good now. I'm yeah. good now. Okay, we'll see if this lasts. All right, so moving on. So the first application of this is, can we turn iron into ruthenium? I'm trying to be an alchemist here. So what I'm showing here is a potential energy services for ruthenium trismipy. This is a wonderful molecule because I start in a single ground state, I excite to this MLCT state, and then I get stuck here for about a microsecond because these metal centered states where I flipped a spin in my D manifold are higher in energy than the MLCT. And so this is the basis for basically all the photo redox chemistry, disensitized solar cells, and a lot of photocatalysis. But ruthenium is expensive. And so we'd obviously like to switch to iron, which is also a D6 metal. The problem is that when you go to iron trispipi, the ligand field is weaker. And so these metal centered states are between the, the charge transfer state and the ground state. So you excite into the charge transfer state, and within about 200 femtoseconds, you dumped all your energy into this quintet metal centered state. And so this is a useless photochemical molecule. Um, for the question about the spin crossover, here I've drawn this quintet state at higher energy than the singlet state, but as I heat this up, um, um, the all the vibrational frequencies in this quintet state are weaker because you're putting electrons into the antibonding orbitals. So um, uh, there's basically more entropy in the quintet state. And so for many molecules, as you heat it up, 
this surface drops and then the ground state becomes the quintet state. And so there's a whole, there's a whole range of D6 molecules, mostly iron that do this. All right. And so, right, so we've dumped all this energy. Now there are many research groups, um, I see Georgi here, um, who's looked at some of these things, um, who are trying to solve this problem. And one way to do it is to use very strong field ligands. And so in this case with this ligand, because these, we have these carbenes, we move the triplet and quintet states uh, both out and up. Now you can excite the MLCT and you get stuck here for about 500 picoseconds before you move um, either into this triplet and down or directly down. Okay, and so these are some good molecular design uh, ideas, but the problem is uh, there's been a long-standing controversy as to how you get, let's see, from um, the MLCT state into this quintet state. Are you going directly into the quintet or do you spend some time in the triplet first? And so uh, when I started this work, um, there had been so one of the first time resolved X-ray absorption experiments with a slicing source, I believe, um, made a claim that we're really going from a singlet MLCT to a triplet MLCT directly to the quintet uh, metal centered surface. Um, uh, then one of the first experiments from the LCLS using X-ray emission um, made a claim that we're actually going quickly into the triplet surface and then even faster into the quintet surface. Um, the Cherry group later did some femtosecond um, ultraviolet spectroscopy and saw that it looked from that experiment like spin crossover was complete in less than 50 femtoseconds. And these groups have um, had lots of follow-up experiments since. And so we thought that since we have this really nice spin selectivity uh, that we can put this to rest once and for all. And so uh, in our case, we use this molecule as iron trisphenanthraline. Um, and here are the spectra in real cross-section units of um, the, um, the singlet state and the quintet state. I'm actually taking these from that thermal spin crossover molecule, but I want to show what the relative amplitudes are. Um, the ground state for this molecule looks almost the same as this singlet A1 state. Now we're doing a pump probe spectroscopy. And so we can think what should happen if we take a singlet ground state with this black spectrum and replace it with this uh, quintet state. And, oh, I didn't save, all right. So uh, I didn't, uh, when my thing died, I didn't save the one last slide I put in. So what we're doing is we're doing femtosecond transient absorption spectroscopy. And what I'm gonna show you is gonna be a different spectrum. So imagine taking um, this black spectrum and subtracting, um, sorry, Imagine taking um, the excited state spectrum of this quintet and subtracting the ground state spectrum. I should have a big positive feature at about 57 electron volts and a negative feature at high energy. And so this is a contour plot of what we see when we do our pump probe spectroscopy. We're photo exciting at about 550 nanometers. I've got the energy axis along the x-axis and a time axis along the y-axis. Red is new excited state features Purple is loss of ground state features. And so the first thing we'll do is we'll look at long times here. And we'll see that when we've got to about a picosecond, when we think we've done photo-induced spin crossover, that we get this particular spectrum where we have this peak at 57 and a trough between 65 and 70. If I take that thermal spin crossover molecule, the one I said was my favorite slide from this whole talk, and I do the hot spectrum minus the cold spectrum, we get essentially the same thing. Okay, this really shows that we have converted a low spin ground state into a high spin excited state. Now, we care about the time scales here. So let's take some kinetic slices along this high spin feature. And what we see is that we get, a, we get this rise that sort of keeps rising after time zero. This little blip here is the IRF. And you're gonna see these wiggles in the spectrum. What I'll show you, um, in a couple slides is this is a coherent vibration on that quintet surface because we go to it so quickly. Now, more importantly for the question we were trying to answer, you see this bump right here at about 65 EV. This was not there at time zero, so it's not the MLCT state. It's not there at long times. Um, if we look at some kinetics, we can see that it peaks at about 100 femtoseconds and then decays away to about nothing. 
All right, so this is a unique electronic state. This is the signature of the triplet. Now, we're going to do some global fitting, and I'm just going to show you the fit lines to show that it does work. And I can talk about the fitting later uh, in more detail, but I want to sort of walk you through it. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a global fit where we're going to um, extract some populations and some spectra. And the model we're using is we start in an MLCT state. Oh, we're going to move to a triplet and then to a quintet, and we're going to allow some oscillation on that quintet surface. And so we get a spectrum of each of these things, including a spectrum of that oscillation. So you can imagine taking these populations, multiplying them array-wise times these spectra, and we recreate that experimental spectrum. And so now what we can do is we can look at this spectra that we extract and compare them with our simulations of what the spectra should look like. And that's what we have down here, where the MLCT state happens to be weak. It turns out that for purely coincidental reasons, the MLCT state looks very much like the ground state. We have our quintet state, which has this peak at about 57 EV and um, a bleach at high energy. And then the really important thing is this triplet. So in our experiment, just extracting from the spectrum, we get this strong peak at about 65 electron volts. That also comes out, uh, that comes out of the simulation that gives us good evidence that we really do have a triplet peak there. Um, you'll notice that the intensity of the, of the triplet spectrum that we get from the fit is much higher than the simulation. This is because we're treating this as just first order kinetics. We really just have one passage through this triplet state. And so th that's not really the right model to use. Um, and so that sort of amplifies the extracted spectrum. Now, the important thing that I want to uh, teach this audience is that we have this two peak, um, uh, the oscillation we get has these two downward features. So basically on top of the population kinetics, there's these two peaks going down, up, down, up. Um, and this oscillates about every 250 femtoseconds. All right, so it's, it's not so surprising that our molecule is gonna be vibrating in the excited state. We're getting to the state within about 200 femtoseconds. Um, but just because the molecule is vibrating, that doesn't mean that our spectrum should necessarily be changing. Um, the spectrum is not the molecule. We need some mechanism for why a particular stretch will cause this particular change in absorption. And so the way to think about that is to once again go back to our correlation diagrams. Now this is one where I'm forcing the system to stay in the high spin state for the whole, um, no matter what the ligand field strength. And so if I draw my potential surfaces, I'm launching a wave packet on the compressed side of my quintet surface, which means it's at high ligand field strength or high 10 dQ. If you notice that our states here in the atomic case start as um, these three clumps of peaks, but then as you impose your ligand field symmetry, these are gonna broaden out. And so we're gonna start with a fairly broad spectrum. As this thing goes back and forth on the surface, it's gonna go to low 10 dQ, back to high 10 dQ and settle on its equilibrium value. And so we should see a broadening, shrinking, broadening, shrinking. If I then simulate what those spectra should look like in the high spin state as a function of the ligand field, I can subtract the high field versus the low field and I get a very good match to my experimental spectrum. So um, uh, this particular symmetric stretch has a spectral fingerprint that is imprinted on the oscillation and that's what we can get from this. Um, and we also get the period of the stretch. So by looking at both the shape and the frequency of the spectrum, we can identify what is the vibrational mode. Um, so this is sort of um, backing around. We can't do scattering or excess assets energy range, but there's enough information content in the spectrum, the absorption spectrum that we can get um, some structural information. Um, and so just kind of the summary of what we get from this, uh, from this work I th we showed that this triplet intermediate is going to mediate rapid spin crossover, and we can extract both a period um, and um, the particular um, vibration that we're looking for. Um, so we've been sort of expanding this. And once again, a big part of our work is figuring out what is the information content in our spectrum. And so we looked at a different molecule. We actually synthesized this ourselves. Um, this is sort of looks like um, 
iron best herpy, but it's a floppier ligand. And we once again do the pump probe spectroscopy. We get another contour plot that looks similar to the other one. We have this um, triplets feature that comes in and goes away. But if you notice the wiggles here are much slower. Um, these have a period of somewhere uh, like 900 femtoseconds. And so we were, so this was curious. And if we look at the spectrum of that oscillation, um, in purple is the oscillation spectrum I showed on the previous page that I said was the symmetric stretch. Here the oscillation is much slower. It's only a 42 wave number oscillation. It has this asymmetric downward features and a positive feature at high energy. So we thought, okay, what the heck is this? Um, and we can look at what um, the, if we look at the difference between the, uh, the singlet ground state and the quintet excited state and what vibration should be activated, we can see one that is this rocking mode uh, with a frequency of about 40 wave numbers. There's also a breathing mode. And this is similar to the one in the um, in Iron Twist Bippy or um, the Iron Twist Finanthroly. And so, so can we simulate what these spectra should look like, uh, the oscillation of these spectra should look like in our XGB region? And so we can um, do a potential energy scan. Um, in this case, we're using ab initio ligand field, multi uh, sorry, ab initio ligand field theory to try to extract our ligand field parameters. We then put that into our simulation and we see how the absorption spectrum here shown as this contour plot should change as a function of this rocking motion. And we can do the same thing for the breathing stretch and see how the spectrum should change as a function of the iron nitrogen distance. Now these look a bit similar here. Um, I had to squint when my students showed me this. It's easier to see when I just simulate the spectrum in its um, expanded versus compressed. So that's the black line versus the orange line here for the rock. You can see a much bigger difference for the breathing motion here. If we then subtract the expanded versus the compressed, we can see that uh, uh, there's a different prediction for what the oscillation should look like in energy for the breathing versus the rocking, uh, the red versus the blue. And if you look at our experiment, it seems to match the rocking motion much better. So we think we actually are really zeroing in on the fact that the experiment shows spectroscopically that we have this rocking motion in the excited state much more than the breathing motion. And so now we're trying to look at the potential energy surfaces. We're doing um, some theory work to try to really justify this a little better. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to um, some new experimental work and skip some other experimental work we've done. Um, Do you want to take a break? Do you want to take a break for questions at this point, a second break? No, let me just go right to the future stuff and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. All right, great. All right, so where are we going with this? And did I lose it? Okay, can everybody see my screen here? Uh, no, not yet. No, there we go. Yes. Okay. I want to get ideas from people on what we should be doing with this. So we started measuring photophysics of a bunch of other molecules. We published some on cobalt. Um, we're looking at things like these manganese cobalt um, heterobimetallic complexes, which have very complicated d-electron manifolds, where we're pumping what we think is a metal-to-metal -metal charge transfer transition and then probing at both the manganese and the cobalt edges. So you can see that these things are fairly well separated in the ground state. And then in our time resolve spectra, which we don't understand yet fully, but we see changes in both the manganese region and the cobalt region. And so we're still trying to decipher uh, what's exactly going on here. Um, sample wise, uh, going back to Yulia's question, we've been making some microfluidic um, flow cells for doing spectroelectric chemistry. And we've been working a lot with the LCLS sample team, making liquid jets. We need, um, so really we can go through about 500 nanometers of solvent, um, specifically organic solvents like chloroform, um, will never be able to get through water at this energy range. But things without too much nitrogen or oxygen um, are actually just about as transparent as our silicon nitride substrates. And so we're starting to, to implement um, some liquid sheet experiments in our system. Um, and the kinds of questions we want to answer 
are, say, looking at hidden states in real honest-to-God catalysts. So this is a nickel iron hydrogenase um, synthesized by the Rockfuss group here. And it takes electrons and protons and pumps out hydrogen. And um, the idea is that there are several states which are stable enough to put in a bottle and take uh, get a crystal structure of, and some are only postulated because they're too short-lived to measure with steady state techniques. Um, and one particular question we want to answer with this is, um, how do the geometric changes, you notice here we have a nickel two square planar that becomes a nickel one tetrahedral system. So how does it get from here to here? Uh, once again, when you protonate this, it goes back to a nickel two square planar. And there was some really intriguing theory work from uh, Sharon Hammer Schiffer's group that postulated that, or calculated, that when you go from this iron one nickel one to an iron two nickel two with a proton bound, it actually doesn't go straight here. First, you get an isomerization to an iron zero nickel two. This nickel two is now much more basic, and so uh, the proton attacks here. We thought, okay, what about the previous step? When you move the electron onto the nickel two square planar, is it actually going onto the iron to make an iron zero, and then you get isomerization, or do you get a nickel one square planar? What is this pathway? And so our solution is to synthetically attach a chromophore onto this. This is all postulated. These are all simulations. Don't believe anything I'm saying right now. But the idea is we're going to excite a chromophore, get photoinduced electron transfer um, onto the cluster, and then by looking at the electronic, uh, sorry, the element and the oxidation state specificity, along with some geometrical specificity, we'll be able to see are we making the iron zero or the nickel one? How do we get through um, these hidden steps in the process? So with that, I'll conclude and uh, we have some time for questions. So I, uh, I hope I've shown that m edge zanes is a really useful um, spectral, uh, spectral probe of electronic structure, both in ground state and in the excited state of these transition metal complexes. And that's good for now. Very good, thank you. It's a great talk. Um, there's a number of questions. Uh, we'll start with Renee Bess. Hi, hello. I have a question. Uh, can you push a little bit forward the, the device for reaching, let's say, 150 electron volt? Yes, so the way that you get to higher energy is a bit counterintuitive. We're coming in with, a, with an, 800 nanometer um, high, uh, high harmonic generation pulse. If we came in with um, something like 1500 nanometer, um, um, it's a longer, longer wavelength or shorter, slower oscillation of the electric field. So the electron that you rip away from the neon spends more time away from the neon, therefore collects more energy from the field and comes back with more energy. And so there are several groups in the United States um, and really all around the world that have gotten up to about 300 electron volts using 1.5 micron light. Um, in some champion experiments, um, the, um, um, the Captain Murnane group of Colorado has used four micron light and got to kilo electron volt photons, even gotten some, some pretty good ground state um, um, XF spectra in that range. So you can get to higher energy. Um, with our current system, we can push it to maybe about 120 electron volts, but maybe not beyond that. Okay, thank you. So have you thought of uh, trying OH spectroscopy for really heavy elements like lanthanide and actinide? We, yes. Um, I've been trying to think if, um, so we've thought about going to there. Um, we haven't yet figured out the killer application for those, but if you have ideas, I'd be happy to hear them because I'm trying to sort of, you know, I like the physical phenomenon, but I also like sort of seeing how far we can push the spectroscopy and what new molecules we can look at. And so um, send me some thoughts you have on uh, what we could see there. Okay, yeah, we can. Uh be in contact just to discuss yeah. about it. Yeah. Great. Right. Great. Next question is from Dugan. 
Hi, Josh Dugan Hayes. Uh, excellent talk. Um, I had a question about your uh, the simulations for the for the metal complex. You you said that um, you know accidentally the the MLCT spectrum oh, yeah. looks essentially the same as the ground state. Is that true for both the the singlet and the triplet? Um. Okay. So here's the reason why. So the is that true for the singlet and the triplet? Um, so the question is, so the singlet, triplet, and quintet are all um, iron two. The, the MLCT is an iron three. And the tricky thing is you'll notice that, okay, so when you go, it's pretty straightforward that when you go from, say, so here's a cobalt two to a cobalt three. The cobalt three is going to hold the electrons more tightly, and so there's going to be a blue shift in the spectrum. And that's what people see at K edges, L edges, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but also, when you go from a low spin to a high spin system or from a singlet to a doublet, there's now more exchange stabilization because you have, um, uh, you have orbital angular momentum in the core as well. That tends to move the spectrum back to lower energy. And so you get, um, there's both a blue shift and a red shift and not much um, change in the shape of the spectrum. That's purely coincidence. And so it's hard for us to see the MLCT state. Okay. And that, but there's no, and it, that goes for both the single and triplet MLCT. They, you don't see oh, enough of ah, a difference between them. Okay. So, um, so we're doing a very local probe of just the metal spin state. We have no idea as far as the, the coupling um, between the the ligand spin and the metal spin. And so that's sure. what the MLCT singlet versus triplet is, is basically whether you're pointing the same direction as your ligand spin. We can't see that at all. Okay. Thanks. We only know what the metal knows and not the ligand. All right, Yulia, you have a question? Um, thank you. So I pretty much continue about the experimental details. So sure. it would be interesting to know what is your repetition rate and um, do you like refresh the sample or do you locally heat the sample? All right, so we have, um, so the repetition rate is one kilohertz. We, um, uh, so as far as things like sample damage, so we rarely see damage from the XUV source. We sometimes for some cobalt complexes, we do see photo reduction from the XUV photons. It's about an order of magnitude less, um, uh, then you get at the L edge, which basically tracks with the energy of the photon. The pump definitely will damage a sample because we're um, we're in ultra high vacuum here to not absorb the X-ray photons. So there's nowhere for the heat to go. And so what we do is we um, actually have a little vapor cell where we have our silicon nitride, um, our molecule, and then another window. And we pass uh, nitrogen gas between these two windows and the nitrogen gas uh, takes the heat away. Um, so you basically have maybe 20 or 30 tor of nitrogen bumping into the sample as we've gained heat away. We also raster scan our samples while we're doing that. Uh, but if we're, if we're careful, um, we can raster over the same sample region um, for hours at a time and see no damage. If we're not careful, we blast the sample in, um, in a couple minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, time resolution. So yes. What is your... So this is determined for us by our pump. So we're getting about 30 femtosecond time resolution. So we're making the XUV photons with a 35 femtosecond IR beam. Um, you always get some compression because you only make the XUV photons at the peak of your IR pulse. So we think our the XUV pulse is on the order of about 15 femtoseconds long. Um, our NOPA gets us uh, maybe 25 femtosecond um, pulses. And so by the time you get through all the mirrors, sorry, all the windows and the cross correlation, it's around 30, 35 femtoseconds. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'll end with a couple of my questions for you, Josh. Sure. Um, first one is, um, uh, you have that fascinating manifold of possible transitions uh, based, on the, based on the group theory. Yes. But the dipole, yeah, but the, the dipole selection rule. Uh, 
of course, limits the, uh, the transitions that you'll actually see in the present experiment. Right. So you can do spectroscopy outside the dipole limit um, if you do it through inelastic X-ray scattering, X-ray Raman scattering, uh, yep. people call it. Um, uh, would that be uh, would that be interesting here, or are you getting all the chemical information and you feel your theory is solid enough, and the dipole is good enough for making sure that everything is anchored? So, so far the dipole is working pretty well. Um, for inelastic scattering, you need a lot of photons. And it would be a synchrotron experiment, sure. Yes, yes. And I think, I mean, frankly, if you're going to a synchrotron, you might as well do this with harder X-ray photons. Um, I don't think that there's, there's information to be gained at the M edge with a lot more photons that you wouldn't be better off getting with higher energy photons. If that makes sense. Okay. That makes All right. Sense. So you do. So uh, you don't think there's uh, more richer chemical information hiding in the non the non dipole transitions? You should just go ahead and do K edge if that's uh, if that's available. Yeah, I think probably the combination of K edge and this would would tell you everything you want to know. Okay, um, I don't, got it. I don't know. Um, there, maybe I'm not thinking creatively enough. That would not be the first time. All right. Okay. And uh, uh, last question is, um, and this is a compound question. Yeah. It would start with what's an experiment that you really want to do that has failed, that's been outside of the, the technical reach of the present lab instrumentation. Yeah. And what do you see as the critical piece of the instrumentation that needs to be improved to open up more scope for application? Okay, so we, the big, okay, so the big thing that I've been, that we've been trying to do since I got here, and I think we're now within a few months of getting a proof of concept, is really moving into solution phase. Um, that is the hard thing. We're always going to be photon starved at this energy range. Um, and going through 500 nanometers of solvent is going to attenuate 99.9% um, .9 of our photons. And so um, that is really, you know, if we're trying to like sample preparation has been by far the hardest thing we've done um, and has slowed us down the most. We can't just, you know, it'd be great if we could just um, spread powder over Kapton tape or something like that. Um, it's hard to spin coat very thin layers of molecules. Some molecules don't spin coat well. And so if we can get to solution phase, um, that would be fantastic. So one, uh, you know, one thing that's going to be coming online in a few years is a big XGB user facility at Ohio State that'll basically do what my laser does, but um, at 100 kilohertz uh, repetition rate. And so that'll be a lot more photons that we're really looking forward to using that because then experiments that'll be, uh, you know, like real champion experiments here will be routine experiments there. And so I'm looking forward to that. But I think really the limit of number of photons and sample preparation. Um, so liquid spectroscopy and liquid solves both those problems. You don't have to worry about sample preparation. And if we have enough photons, we can get through the solvent. Okay. I'll take a slightly different spin on it, right? If you're photon starved, you have two ways of dealing with it. One is a brighter source and the other one is a more efficient uh, spectrometer downstream. Yes. So um, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your grading reflectivity? What's your efficiency for taking the photons that come out through the back of the sample and getting them on the CCD? Right. Um, our grading is on the order of 30% efficient, I believe. Um, and um, the CCD quantum, uh, quantum efficiency is around 50%. Mm -hmm. So you know, we could get a factor of two more photons there, but maybe not a whole lot more than that. If we, uh, like I know that I can buy a $20,000. So we're doing the $1,000 Richardson grading. I know where to spend $20,000 and get a grading that'll be about 60% efficient, but I don't know that you can get much more than that. Is this a roll? Is this a roll in geometry? So when you say 60% efficient, it really means that 60% of all photons that get to the grading make it to the camera, or is there an additional sort of brag factor that comes into the efficiency? Um, about okay. So I think at this point, about 30% of the photons that hit the grading get dispersed onto the camera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's not a, there's not a huge upside on the on the spectrometer. Um, 
all right. Yeah, I've been wondering about transition ed sensor arrays, which are, you know, 100% QE. Right. Um, uh, but of course, is, uh, is a pretty big effort to implement. And if there's only a factor of six to be gained, then maybe that's, maybe that's not the way to go. Right. Okay, got it. 